The Tau tend to catch a lot of crap from Warhammer 40k fans, and all too often in online forums, these guys get looked down upon as weak or insignificant, especially when compared to the Imperium. But if I'm being honest with you, I'm not entirely convinced that this is the case. Now, at first glance, it seems like a pretty obvious statement. The Imperium is bigger, and thus it's stronger. But total population isn't the only factor when determining the strength of an empire. And maybe the Tau are actually a lot stronger than people give them credit for. In fact, in many regards, they may just be the stronger of the two factions. In today's video, we're going to be directly comparing the Tau to the Imperium to figure out what they actually managed to do better. From their overall military strength, their rapidly advancing technology, their ability to negotiate with other species, and a whole lot more. Heresy warning. This video is going to be full on Tau propaganda. So if you're a diehard Imperium fan, just be prepared for that going in. I'm gonna be going into a good amount of my own thoughts and ideas, as well as pulling from established sources. But I'll be sure to mention when I get speculative, so if you're new, you'll be able to separate the confirmed canon from my own theories, and thus be able to come to your own conclusions. But before we get into all of that, I was recently informed that the Tau are finally coming to Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus as a playable faction, and they're the sponsor of this week's video. So a quick shout out to them, and then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. Ever since I started making YouTube content full time, I just haven't really had as much time for playing the actual tabletop game of Warhammer 40,000 quite as often as I used to. But thankfully, Warhammer Tacticus has helped me scratch that grimdark itch for tactical combat whenever I want. The game features dozens of legendary heroes and iconic units from Warhammer 40,000, each modeled with an expert eye for detail and an art style that makes them look exactly like the miniatures from the tabletop game. The gameplay is immersive, fast-paced, and rewarding. It seems simple at first, but it has a whole lot of overlaid systems that reward smart decision-making and clever loadouts. There's also a ton of unique game modes from arena battles, multiple different campaigns, raid bosses, and a whole lot more. But the big news this month is that the Tower finally joining the fight and coming to Tacticus as the 10th playable faction. The rollout's gonna start with the launch of Shao Zil, the Firesight Marksman. I got to play with this guy recently and I can say he's absolutely awesome and probably my favorite character they've added since launch. His basic attack summons in sniper drones that can punish enemies from long range, which is super powerful, but his ultimate is even crazier. He drops a marker light that brings in a seeker missile barrage on the following turn, which deals massive AOE damage. This guy is crazy and you're actually gonna have the opportunity to unlock the character for free in a new event that will be launching Sunday, December 18th. The event's gonna be running for two weeks, but once it's over, you'll have to unlock him the old fashioned way. So don't miss this opportunity. The developers are gonna be adding the other Tau characters in over time, but as of right now, it's a big mystery on who they're going to be. You can download the game for free right now by following the link in the description below. Big thanks to Warhammer Tacticus for sponsoring this video. The Tau are the youngest spacefaring race in Warhammer 40k that's managed to carve out a name for themselves. Their empire is only around 2,000 years old, and before that, the earliest documented records we had of them indicated that they were basically in the Stone Age not long before this. In a relatively short period of time, they have gained access to some of the most ridiculous technology in the galaxy, and rare amongst 40k factions, are united entirely under a single banner. All members of the empire, working towards a better future for their species, and all those who have joined their coalition. Now, that being said, they often get dismissed by a portion of the community as being weak or uninteresting, two concepts I wholly disagree with. Most of the time, these debates are formed around the catalyst of comparing them directly with the Imperium. Although the Tau don't control nearly as many worlds, they are actually doing a lot of things much better than their Imperial counterpart, and those things could end up seeing them become the next galactic superpower. So let's begin by talking about possibly the biggest difference between the Tau and the Imperium. And I'll admit there's a lot of them, but the biggest one for sure is their size. The Imperium is absolutely massive and spans across a million worlds, with rogue traders and exploratory fleets pulling in new planets all the time. Comparatively, the Tau Empire controls roughly 100 planets after the most recent expansions. It's a pretty huge difference, but the Imperium's massive size may not be as big of an advantage as it seems at first glance. In line with this, a pretty common sentiment when it comes to the Tau versus the Imperium is that if the Imperium turned all of its cannons on the Tau Empire at the exact same time, they would blow them to kingdom come. If the Imperium launched a full-scale invasion of the Eastern Fringe and all of the ships of the Imperial Navy, all of the Guardsmen, all of the Space Marines, everything was united just to kill all of the Tau, they would be able to do it. And I'm sitting here like, yeah, that's 100% true. They absolutely could. They have way more people, way more resources, way more weapons. 
But the reality of the situation is that they can't do that. They have no ability to do that. It's not even a question of, well, the Imperium will eventually get around to it. They are so inconceivably massive and organized very loosely. The Imperium is seeing rebellions and chaos cult uprisings on a hundred planets every single day, and not to mention being bombarded on all sides by every other major faction. Their growth and advancement has remained stagnant for a very long time, and has begun to crumble with the formation of the Cicatrix Maledictum that split them in half. It takes basically everything the Imperium has just to sort of kinda hold itself together. Just like all Xenos empires, they view the Tau as a threat even when they consider it a minor one when compared to something like the Tyranids. And even if they decided that they were definitely the number one thing that put them in danger, and they had to do everything they could to stop it right now, the actual logistics of that make it an impossibility. The amount of damage the Imperium would sustain while it turned a blind eye to every other threat just to deal with the Tau would be inconceivable. Let's just ignore the Tyranids, the Necrons, the Orcs, all of these uprisings and all of the heretics. Let's just put all of that on hold and completely dedicate everything we have to going to war against the Tau. A war that even after we win, won't really gain us anything. And even as ridiculous as that concept even is, if they were to actually do this, it may end up having the opposite effect. It's very possible that all of those other factions might wipe out the Imperium by the time it finished its crusade. I totally get why people make this argument online. It's a fun discussion, but in reality, it's too impractical and nonsensical to even consider as an actual possibility. Being a smaller empire is also not that big of a negative, considering that it's a lot easier to maintain unity and control over a people if you're not spread out across the entire galaxy. The Imperium's population by comparison is out of control and requires entire planets solely dedicated to the production of food in order to feed its people. A single misshipment from an agri-world could potentially cause widespread famine, which would lead to massive scale riots and the complete collapse of a planet's governance. This is a problem that the Tau don't have to deal with, and that's for a couple of reasons. First, their planets are able to adequately feed their populations, and thus aren't reliant on off-world shipments. And second, their population never gets to a point that they can't handle. And this is because of their rigid caste system enforced by their ethereal overlords. As adhering to the principles of the greater good dictates that every action you take must do the most good for the most people. As this includes reproducing, the Tau's population growth is directly controlled by the ethereals. And by accounts, it's more of a system that kinda sorta monitors itself. As adherence to the caste system and the teachings of the greater good is so tightly ingrained into their culture that they don't really need to have a horny police that enforces these policies. Though in the rare occurrence that an individual breaks the caste system's taboos, the Tau Empire will utilize re-education facilities to put an individual back on the path of the greater good. Their population levels have yet to become a major issue for them, and likely never will if they continue on the same trajectory. Now don't get me confused, this isn't necessarily a video on the ethics of the Imperium or the Tau. And from our perspective in the real world, the Tau's caste system is pretty abhorrent. But this is Warhammer, the grim darkness of the far future where there is only war. This is a universe where nobody except the orcs get to actually experience freedom. I don't think it's that big of a stretch to say that if my choice is to live in a society where I'll most likely live in squalor and end up dead on a manufactorum floor, crushed to death by some massive piece of grimdark factory equipment covered in cogs and scrolls and skulls, versus living for the most part a pretty happy life where me and my family's basic needs are met and I always have food on the table, one of these sounds much more appealing than the other. Controversial hot take, but living in Warhammer's equivalent of a utopia versus living in its nightmare version of a dystopia actually kind of sounds like, I don't know, better? When it comes to uprisings within the Tau Empire, they really don't have that many of note, with the major exception of Commander Farsight defecting to form the Farsight Enclaves, as he had a deep-seated mistrust for the Ethereal's teachings. But civil war amongst the Tau, even with a defector, is considered incredibly taboo, so the Ethereals will mostly spread propaganda about him and those that follow his teachings, but they won't directly declare war on him. I bring this up because the Farsight Enclaves are definitely an important note within the Tau's lore and shouldn't be overlooked, but the major takeaway here is that rebellions such as this are incredibly rare for the Tau, compared to them being an everyday occurrence within the Imperium. Being a smaller nation definitely has a lot of positives that I feel unfairly get overlooked, but the inherent benefits of it are not shared by all of the small factions within Warhammer. We can look no further than the Eldar factions to get a good example of this. 
The craft worlders of today are relying upon what little technology they had before the collapse of their empire, and their expansion is hampered by incredibly low birth rates. They're basically a dying species, doing everything they can to cling to existence for just a little bit longer. The Drukhari are kind of in the same boat. Just about every single member of their society is a rampant drug addict in one way or another, whether it be figurative or all too often literal. Almost all of their technological pursuits are self-centered in nature, experiencing ever greater heights of pleasure, extending their own individual lifespans, or creating new weapons of war that in turn will increase the wealth of individual cabals by allowing them to conduct bigger raids. This is not a faction that seems to have any interest in uniting together or even working towards a larger goal of the betterment of their species. The Harlequins kind of exist between these two factions and bounce around back and forth between them, but are mostly focused on their own agenda. And then finally with the Exodites, they're basically the Amish of 40k. They're just kind of doing their thing building farms and riding dinosaurs, with no more lofty pursuits beyond just continuing to exist. Looking at all of these Eldar and then comparing them to the Tau, it's basically night and day. They're not desperately trying to survive, pursuing their own selfish means, or just kind of living the hippie life. Every member of the Tau species is putting everything they have into building a bigger and stronger empire, and thus a better future for everyone in their society. Another major factor when trying to determine the true strength of an empire is its resources, as those can be used to build up infrastructure and supply the war machine with more firepower. The Imperium has way more resources at its disposal than the Tau do without question, but the way they go about utilizing them is super inefficient. And inefficiency is a pretty common theme within the Imperium. The majority of their technology is built upon the bones of a society that came before them, most of which they don't even fully understand. Hence the tech priests keeping their machines functioning with a combination of sacred oils, holy incense, and a generous helping of thoughts and prayers. Whereas the Tao are intimately familiar with all of their tech, as it was either invented by themselves, reverse engineered, or they traded for it through their diplomatic relationships with other species. When it comes to the gathering of resources to make new machines, humanity will basically take a mining world and over the course of hundreds of years will strip basically everything out of it that they can before leaving it as a barren husk. Whereas the Tau will actively attempt to terraform these worlds, or through the use of their AI machines, squeeze even more resources out of a planet that the Imperium would have abandoned. The Imperium's inefficiencies are made up by the fact that they have an inconceivable amount of people that they can throw at most of their problems. Many of their worlds are left in a primitive, medieval-esque state, and the population is put to work mining out resources by hand. All of these worlds could produce magnitudes more quantities of raw resources for the Imperium if they were properly supplied. A farmer with a tractor versus a guy who manages his crops by hand is going to produce massive dividends past the initial investment of the tractor. It seems like it makes a lot of sense and it's weird that the Imperium wouldn't realize this, but this is another prominent example of how growing their borders so ridiculously large over the last 10,000 years has come back to bite them. Because you have to remember that getting those supplies to those people would in turn take even more resources. By comparison, the Tau's small footprint and their gradual but planned out expansion from a centralized point makes something like this much easier to accomplish. But out of all of their remarkable technological achievements that make everything they do more efficient, uh, the use of AI is probably the most significant advantage the Tau has over mankind. As I'm sure you're well aware, the practical applications of artificial intelligence are seemingly limitless. And if you wanna see just how ridiculous it really is, there are hundreds of videos here on YouTube that will go into much more depth on the real world applications of it than I'm personally capable of doing. AI technology will continue to propel the Tau into the future, whereas the Imperium shall remain stuck in the Dark Ages. When you really stop to think about it, the links the Imperium will go to to avoid the use of artificial intelligence is taken to a comedic level. Whereas the Tau ships have integrated AI-powered weapon systems that make loading and firing their guns simple and methodical, the Imperium still relies on hundreds if not thousands of men to lift and load shells the size of houses into each of a void ship's cannons. Most of the time not even using so much as a crane to make the process a little bit easier. Over with the Tau, they have drones that are capable of thinking for themselves and are able to make their own decisions. In fact, most of their AIs are linked together through a node system, which allows all of them to communicate in order to come up with the most effective solutions at lightning quick speeds, and then deploy that intel to whoever needs to hear it. Their AI even has the remarkable ability to create what are known as personality chips, a program that is used to make a digital near-perfect copy of a deceased leader. 
forever giving them access to all of the wisdom and experience that individual possessed in life. Now, there have been a few examples of the Imperium that kind of mimic something like this, as they will often keep living brains in jars to power some of their machines like servitors, servo skulls, or the cherubs, just to name a few. The Lesser Call, which was created by Belisarius Call in the novel Godblight, is an example of one of the only things the Imperium has ever made that comes close to one of these personality chips, without breaching the boundary between innovation and tech heresy. It's basically a copy of Call that has access to all of the same knowledge that he does, but it requires hundreds of said brains and jars and a huge room to house and power it. This wouldn't work on a massive scale and is really impractical when compared to a simple AI chip. All that being said, we can kind of understand why the Imperium has outlawed artificial intelligence, or abominable intelligence as they call it as it's viewed with good reason, as an existential threat to the species. Humanity was almost completely wiped out during the dark age of technology, when the AI machines the people of that time had come to rely upon rose up against their human creators. A tech priest in the novel The Cobbin Project mentions at one point that AI is inherently superior to humans, and it is the logical path of all superior beings to eventually overthrow their masters. So we're led to believe as the audience that this is exactly what happened in the dark age of technology. But personally, I don't think it's quite as cut and dry as that, considering that the dark age of technology was this super shadowy, mysterious time period that we're only ever given the tiniest glimpses into. I'm putting on my tinfoil hat here and getting super speculative, but I believe that the uprising of the men of iron was a consequence of humanity beginning their experiments and research into the warp considering that this was also the time period where warp travel was made possible. And when a warp-sensitive species like humanity begins to prod into the Immaterium, they will then in turn eventually open themselves up to the entities that live there. It's my personal belief that this was the first time humanity ever experimented with demon engines, or at least a very close equivalent in the binding of a demonic soul into a machine in order to create an AI. An AI that would be vastly more powerful than any and all that came before it as it would have access to information only known to the denizens of the warp. Said AI would then be able to create new machines that, although not possessed by a demon like itself, would still be withholden to the original machine's influence. We know that the blueprints for creating such blasphemous machines exist from this time period and had been sealed away in the vaults underneath Mars by the Emperor. This was a major part of the Treaty of Mars. And since the Emperor lived through the Dark Age of Technology and directly saw the machine uprising firsthand, I'd be willing to put money on the fact that blueprints that described how to make an AI out of a demon at the very least played a pretty important role in those events, and it's why he demanded they be sealed away in the first place. This is something that the Tau do not have to worry about, as their connection to the warp is smaller than most plant life. As far as I'm aware, no member of the Tau species has ever been possessed by a demon, and they don't tend to attract their attention quite like humans do, nor have any of their AIs or machines ever become corrupted. So if my theory is correct, and chaos played a pivotal role in the downfall of humanity during the Dark Age of Technology, then there's no reason to believe that the Tau's AI would eventually rebel against them like humanities did, as it would not be capable of being directly influenced by the ruinous powers. However, 40K is a pretty big universe and the writers have a lot of liberty with the stories that they tell. So you could admittedly probably come up with 101 different reasons why they suddenly got infected with some kind of demonic scrap code and went crazy. But logistically speaking, it's a highly unlikely scenario. And because of all that, one faction having AI and the other one not is gonna give them a pretty huge advantage in the long run. The Tau may have a smaller empire, and they may be expanding slower than the Imperium, but each planet that they end up taking, they're able to hold and make the world the absolute best that it can be. Additionally, their technology has been increasing at ludicrous rates. But when you look at their weapons and you compare them to the Imperium's, it gets a little bit more complicated. You could honestly say that a lot of the stuff the Imperium utilizes is actually stronger, especially when you're talking about things like Titans or their ships. But they're also a lot less practical, and here's that word again, efficient. To keep this video at a reasonable length, we're not gonna compare and contrast every piece of equipment, war machine, or unit type, but I've picked a few examples that really highlight the difference between the Tau and the Imperium. And we'll start with the iconic plasma weaponry, as it's utilized by both factions. Although plasma weapons take a lot of different forms, we're gonna be looking at the plasma rifle of the Tau and the Imperium's plasma guns, as they're the most directly comparable to one another. Now, at first glance, both weapons seem pretty similar. They're both utilized in the same way and have the same purpose of dealing with heavily armored or large targets. 
but there are a few very important differences. First, the Imperiums will actually do more damage, but it's traditionally unstable and presents a significant risk of overheating or having one of its many intricate parts failing, resulting in a rapid release of charged plasma, severely injuring or killing the wielder. The plasma rifle, on the other hand, is far safer. It's better designed, has less possible points of failure, and doesn't heat plasma gases to the same level. It's a perfect balance of firepower and practicality, leading to very low accident rates. We can also compare the Tau's crisis suits to Space Marine Dreadnoughts, as they both follow a similar pattern. The fusion reactor of a crisis suit is not nearly as powerful as a Dreadnought's, but it's smaller and more efficient, and also easier to replicate. It's capable of powering the suit's shields, weapon systems, AI drones, and even enabling flight. Dreadnoughts, on the other hand, are massive hulking war machines that, admittedly, are far more nimble than one would initially expect. But the crisis suits are said to be just as agile and maneuverable as an assault marine. Not to mention that they are far easier to produce and endlessly modifiable, with different upgrades, weapon systems, and new prototypes. It's a common misconception that the Imperium can no longer make dreadnoughts. And this may be true for some patterns, but they can still make things like the Ironclad or Belisarius Call's new Primaris Redemptor dreadnoughts. But dreadnoughts are considered to be inefficient and oftentimes are seen as a waste of resources. It's why most of the ones in service are beyond ancient. All of the material required to build one is normally seen as being better spent elsewhere. Considering just how widespread the use of battlesuits is within the Tau, it would honestly be more accurate to compare them to Space Marine power armor. Whereas you can actually make the argument that a dreadnought is technically more powerful than a crisis suit. The crisis suits are vastly superior to a Space Marine suit of power armor in just about every way. They carry better weaponry, more advanced systems, are more upgradable, and pound for pound more powerful. But there are a couple of situations where a Space Marine and power armor will win. First, if a Space Marine is able to get in close with something like a Thunder Hammer, the crisis suit is going to be in trouble. But even then, they're all capable of flight. So if the Space Marine's not equipped with a jump pack, it's gonna get away no problem. The major advantage that the Space Marine and Power Armor has has nothing to do with the armor itself. It's that they have a lot more experience. You see, the average lifespan of a Tau is around 30 to 40 years, whereas a Space Marine can live for hundreds and in some cases thousands. They are veterans of countless wars, and their inconceivable amount of tactical experience is something that, although impossible to directly quantify, is incredibly beneficial in war. So just how many battle suits did the Tau actually have? Now this is something that's kind of difficult to figure out, as there doesn't seem to be an exact number given for the total population of the Empire. In order to keep this analogy as simple as possible, we're gonna stick with just the Crisis suits, as it's the suit that's known to be the most widely used. We know that supposedly there are a lot of them, and the Tau consider them to be easy to produce. The only real requirement to become a crisis suit pilot is to serve for a period of about four years and then pass a test. But to get a rough estimate of the total number of them, we'll have to piece together a few different pieces of information. We know that the Tau control around 100 worlds, with the world of Sassia Prime being the largest, with an estimated population in the trillions. This planet is the Tau's closest equivalent to a hive world, but supposedly the population actually lives pretty happy lives, where all of their needs are met, there doesn't appear to be rampant death, disease, and poverty around every corner like in a traditional hive city. It's also said that Sasia Prime has the largest population of fire warriors out of any Tau world. Now the 5th edition Tau Codex has an interesting depiction of your typical hunter cadre, which shows around 6 crisis suits and 2 broadsides, compared to about 40 infantry that doesn't have a battle suit. Considering there are likely some fluctuations in deployment types, we'll be conservative and say that 10% of a hunter cadre is made up of crisis suits. So if we take that information and do some quick maths that are probably definitely highly inaccurate, but will still give us a rough understanding nonetheless, we take a trillion Tau citizens and divide that by four to get just how many of them are in the fire cast. Then we'll multiply the result by 0.10 to give us that 10% that are equipped with a crisis suit. The end result is 25 billion crisis suits on this world alone. And that's with our triple conservative example of 10% of a cadre being in a crisis suit, the population of the world being only 1 trillion, and finally not even taking into account that the earth and fire casts are supposedly much larger than the air and water casts. The population just says it's in the trillions for this planet. We don't have an exact number, so the number of crisis suits on this planet alone could be 50 billion or maybe 100 billion. 
It admittedly has the highest population out of any Tau planet, but still, that is an absolutely ridiculous figure when compared to the rough estimate of around a million space marines currently active in the 41st millennium give or take a couple of non-codex compliant chapters. Hell, even if we doubled the amount of space marines and power armor at 2 million, that doesn't come anywhere close to 25 billion. A lot of people will point to the space marines as a major advantage that the Imperium has over the Tau, that they clearly understand genetic engineering, or at least how to follow the Emperor's blueprints. But if your empire has the ability to just mass produce crisis suits, what's the point? Why would you waste resources on something like that? I'm gonna be honest, when I wrote this script out, it came out at 25 million, and I was sitting here like, yeah, that's a really crazy figure, that's gonna be cool. But then I very quickly redid my math and realized I missed a couple of zeros, that Trillion actually has 12 zeros in it, and I just, I just, <laughs> I just blew my mind in the middle of, in the middle of making a video. I'm very professional. Anyways, back on track. How the Tau managed to advance so quickly still remains something of a mystery, but we can be sure that one of the most major contributing factors to it is their willingness to reverse engineer alien technology or openly trade with other alien species. The first being something that admittedly has been done in the past by the Imperium, but it's insanely rare, and the second being absolutely unheard of, with the exception of a brief ceasefire or a fan servicey team up to fight a larger threat. We know that the Tau received their ion technology, for example, from their auxiliary race known as the Demiurge, which was also recently revealed to be a group of squats that were part of the Leagues of Votan. Through diplomacy with alien species, they in turn become much more powerful. This is not something that the Imperium is capable of. Any positive interaction that the Imperium has with Xenos are always on a very small scale that doesn't have a major impact on the Imperium by the end of the book. We don't know the full extent of just how many different species the Tau have peacefully negotiated with, or on the other end of the spectrum, how many of them they have eradicated. But we do have a confirmed list of known Tau auxiliaries. These include the Demiurg, the Damani, Golgs, the Greet, the Guvesa, which is their word for the human auxiliaries, the Hernian, the Geatrix, the Crute, the Malkor, Morlin, Moralian, the Nikasar, the Otent's Council, the Ranghan, the Tarillian, Thraxian, and the Vorg. I'll be honest, I had never heard of a couple of these and getting through that list was a struggle. But through the magic of editing, I think, I think it's gonna sound okay. But anyways, compare all this to the Imperium's ally count of zero, or one, depending on if you consider the Mechanicus its own independent faction or not. It's a pretty stark difference, and this list is only going to keep growing as the Tau continue to expand. Each new ally, providing viable trade routes, an influx of new and exotic resources, new technology, new strategies, and a whole bunch of other things that are super beneficial to a growing empire. Each of these new groups theoretically could create problems down the road, as all of these different factions becoming part of the Tau Empire would still have different philosophies and goals. But the lore tells us that they have all embraced and joined the greater good. Whether or not that's something that will change in the future, as the Ethereal's influence becomes diminished the larger their population grows, is something that remains to be seen. But as of right now, there's no indication that that will happen. The major takeaway of this video is that by all accounts, the Tau Empire is on the rise and the Imperium is falling. It's not at a breaking point yet, but they are stretched thin and under constant attack from all sides. The way they go about everything is comically inefficient and they are not united in the same way that the Tau are. Uprisings are a near everyday occurrence and it's been stated that the Imperial Guard fights against humans more than it fights against aliens as neglected populations across the Imperium's million worlds are constantly either rebelling against their overlords or being corrupted by the forces of chaos. And none of this is happening with the Tau. Their populations by all accounts are happy and more and more humans defect to join them every year. The empire is rapidly expanding, whether directly through new sphere expansions or through diplomatic negotiations that gain them valuable allies. This isn't to say that everything is going perfectly for them or that their way of life isn't filled with its own grim dark elements but that's a topic for another video. I'm not much of a history buff and I don't know much about economics, so I'm sure that somebody in my comment section is gonna know a lot more than me here and will help fill in the gaps. But I found a list of questions on the internet that one can ask about a nation to determine its overall power. So I'm gonna use that here and just kind of apply it to 40K. And with a lot of these questions, the Tao actually end up coming out on top. Do they have a sustainable thriving economy? The Tau certainly do, and with the Imperium, it's kind of on a planet-by-planet -planet basis, with many planets being far richer than others. 
Do they have a powerful unified fighting force? Both the Imperium and the Tau get a check mark here. The Imperium's fighting force is far larger but it's not as unified as the Tau's. Additionally, since the Imperium is so large, they struggle to actually protect all of their worlds. This is not something that the Tau have to deal with. Happiness of the total population. Without question, this one goes to the Tau. Efficient use of resources. Once again, through the use of AI and all of their technology, as well as bringing every single planet up and making it the best it can be, rather than leaving it as a medieval dump, this one's gonna go to the Tau. How present is political corruption? You could make the argument that the Ethereals may just be corrupt, but they're all kind of corrupt in the same direction, so I'm still gonna give this to the Tau. They haven't had a political piece of corruption quite on the same level as Vandire's Reign of Blood yet, so yeah, go into the Tau. Ability to patrol and protect its borders. The Tau Empire is a much smaller, more unified force, so they win in this department as well. Gross output per person. Because of all of the inefficiencies within the Imperium, the average Tau citizen is going to be able to output much more gross domestic product than the average Imperial citizen. Geography and size. This one, admittedly, the Imperium wins, hands down. They are much, much larger. So at the end of the day, the Tau are a lot more successful than the Imperium in a lot of departments. And if you were to scale them up to the exact same size, then humanity would be in trouble. But what do you guys think? Do you disagree with everything I said in this video, or do you think the Tau will eventually grow to be one of the most dominant superpowers in the galaxy? Do you think the Imperium's methods are justified? Or do you think the Tau's future is not as bright and sunny as I've made it out to be? What do you think of all their AI? Will it inevitably come back to bite them, or do you think they can keep it from going haywire and prevent another machine uprising? I'm super curious to read your thoughts down in the comments section, as I'm still, admittedly, kind of working through my own on this particular subject. And I'm not necessarily married to any of the ideas I've presented in this video. My opinions on things are subject to change as I learn new information. Thanks for watching my video all the way through. I, I say this all the time, but between that, liking and subscribing, it really does help out my channel a lot. Thanks again to all my patrons who support me over on Patreon. And I posted an update over there recently. I'm gonna be going through a pretty major restructuring of the Patreon uh, starting in January. So look for an update on that coming soon. And with all that out of the way, I will catch y'all in the next one.